that was a great intro video. I feel really great about myself right now. Um, <laughs> If you don't know me, uh, my name is Zachary. I'd love to get to know you, but I um, just want to welcome you uh, to our Wheatfield campus. Thanks for being here. Um, if you were like me a little bit, it, it might have been a little difficult for you getting out of bed this morning, right? It was like 34 degrees. I was like, I just want to, go, I just want to stay here. Um, but I th uh, thank you for being with us this morning. Um, big shout out to our Hebron campus, everyone viewing there. Um, love you guys. A shout out to everybody viewing with us online or through our sermon archives. And then uh, hello to our Jasper County Jail campus. Uh, like Pastor John John said, I am Zachary Fraley, and for the past uh, almost five years, I got to serve as the youth director here, and how I would normally introduce myself is like, hey, my name's Zachary, I'm the youth director, and uh, I'm the grown, I'm the uh, adult child on staff, is what I would say, um, and some of y'all are like, yeah, yeah, he is the adult, uh, the adult child on staff, but I've got to let you know, this adult child has grown up a little bit, because um, on Friday, Blair and I actually closed on our house in uh, Iowa, so that was great, um, yeah, it's, it's awesome, it's blue and it's beautiful. Yeah. Woo. It, it's nice. Um, and uh, here's us, you know, signing our life away and uh, me, you know, becoming uh, an adult, <laughs> you know, uh, there was something about it after, after, you know, we were in our house. I was like, wow, I, 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 I think I'm starting to feel like an actual, you know, senior pastor and, you know, ju not just the youth one anymore. I have, I have a mortgage now, um, which is a little terrifying, but you know what? It's, it's great. Uh, and uh, Blair, uh, this is my wife, Blair. She's an ICU nurse, um, and she actually already has a job. It took me about a year to, uh, you know, find this church, interview and everything um, with them. Uh, Blair uh, sent in a resume on Tuesday and had a job offer on Wednesday. Um, yeah, I was like, wow, that's, that's, that's great, honey. Um, I'm, I'm a little jealous of you, uh, but you know, they, they don't really care about the theology of nurses at the point. They, they're just like, okay, cool, you can, you can do all this stuff and you have training, awesome, we'll give you a job. Um, but when we went to go close on our house, Blair's parents also got to come with us. And um, it's so great actually having family, um, you know, to come with us. For me, I, you know, didn't really um, have a family of my own. My mother, I was a child of addicts. Uh, my mother, she passed away when I was in eighth grade. And my father hadn't really been in the picture since I was four. And so um, to have, you know, the family support come along with us and help us throughout this whole process has been great. And Blair has an amazing family. Um, and I was actually raised by my grandparents. And uh, they, they were the ones who, you know, gave up their retirement years where they could have been, you know, on a beach. Uh, sipping coconut drinks, and uh, they chose to raise my sister and I, um, which I'm so thankful for. But my grandmother, she was one of the most dramatic people you would ever uh, meet. Um, Pastor John talked about, you know, my laugh, and I, I get it from her because she had a hugely obnoxious laugh as well. Um, if, if she were alive today, she would be in the front row right now. She'd be wearing one of those, uh, I don't know if you remember them from like old school church, but like one of those Easter hats that's like really big, you know, and pokes everybody's eyes out on either side side. Yeah, she would be wearing that. I'd be like, Grandmom, it's not Easter. She'd be like, I don't care. You know, my baby boy is preaching. I'm going to be up there and I'm going to be, you know, clapping like, yeah, there you go. And um, she was a showboat, literally had to have a Cadillac all the time. The newest Cadillac, every two years, she'd get a new one. And, um, and if she were entering the room, she would make sure that everyone knew. Bells would be ringing. She'd ask, you know, is there a spotlight that can be on me a little bit? Because yeah, my grandson's preaching, but it's really about me, right? That, that's what she would have said. And uh, she was amazing. And one summer, uh, she knew that I needed a job. I had just turned 16, you know, was driving, and she wanted me to have a job, but she didn't want me to just have a normal job, you know, like any 16-year-old. She wanted me to have a prestigious one, or as prestigious as you could get when you're 16 years old. Um, so she was like, you know what? I I'm, I'm going to send you to lifeguard training. And I was not happy about that, right? Even at 16, I was like, I feel like my life is being controlled by this woman. You know, I got to go wherever she says. And I was like, I don't want it. And I almost told her. I almost said, you know what? I'm not going to do it. And she looked at me and I was like, yes, ma'am. I'll Two weeks, whatever. I'll go be a lifeguard. Yes, ma'am. Whatever you want, right? Because no one said no to my grandma. And she was amazing, but I actually, you know, um, as a teenager, I was not that excited about getting out of bed, going to this training for two weeks, you know, uh, losing a little bit of my summer, but I'm so thankful that she sent me to, the, uh, to go and get lifeguarding trained. Um, so I spent two weeks learning how to save people, learning CPR, how to enter the water, you know, what kind of whistles to blow, and, um, and it actually was the career that I, or job that I had throughout college. I uh, eventually became a swim instructor as well, ran a swim school for a while. 
and the things that I remember most, uh, it wasn't necessarily when a kid was swimming for the first time or, you know, when um, I would get to, you know, get up on the lifeguarding chair. The thing that I remember most was when I got to save someone's life. Um, and there were a few times, but one time in particular, I remember I was working in the summer at a big uh, Olympic-sized pool as a lifeguard. And so, you know, you'd get up on the stand and you were, uh, you'd be looking over everything. And there was this one family that would come in every day. And, and there was just this cutest girl that would come in, you know, she's wearing this mini mouse bathing suit. I remember one day um, she had this long, uh, dark hair. She had big brown eyes and the biggest smile ever. She loved to swim in the water. She, uh, she loved, well, she couldn't really swim. But she loved to be in the water. She would just be splashing in there, you know, like little giggles, like, <laughs> you know, playing with toys and stuff, blowing bubbles. And uh, she didn't know how to swim at all. So she would just sort of camp out on these steps, right? And she'd, she'd be there, she'd be splashing. And, you know, as a lifeguard, you're just, you're sort of looking back and forth, you know, surveying the whole pool, uh, making sure that everybody is safe, guarding lives. And one day in particular, this little girl, she got a little too confident and, um, you know, she, she got a little too far to the end of the step and her foot slipped off and uh, she went underwater. And I, I, saw, I saw her as she started to, um, you know, uh, the fear got in her eyes. I saw her eyes just get huge and wide as she realized that she couldn't swim and her arms started flailing. And I saw her getting slowly exhausted as she ran out of breath. And the thing that amazed me was that no one else seemed to notice this little girl next to them drowning right in, and right next to them. So I blew my whistle, I jumped in, swam over to her, um, got her shaking body out of the water, and she spit forward water, you know, started coughing, and started breathing in this huge breath. I could feel her quivering. I could feel the fear in her as she started shaking and gasping for breath, as she realized how close she had been to death. I was able to save her life, and I set her down, and I saw as her fear turned to joy, as she realized that she had been saved, this little angel girl. And her mother, she ran over to me so fearful for what could have happened. But even in my mind, I, I, the, the thoughts going through my head were, who loves this girl? Who even cares about her? Who was watching this little angel girl? Years later, I still sit back every now and then, and I think, you know, what does her life look like? Because I know that I didn't just save her from water, uh, save her from drowning that day, but I believe that God saved her for something. The thing that made me feel accomplished it isn't that I got to save her present. I mean, yes, I, I did jump in there and made sure that an ambulance wasn't uh, needed to be saved or needed to be called. Uh, CPR ha didn't have to be done. But uh, sitting back now, I'm more thankful that I was able to save her for a future, uh, not just from drowning, but for something. I was able to save her future, able to help her to one day maybe give back and save someone else. That little girl, she wasn't just saved from drowning that day. But my prayer is that she was saved for something great. And my other prayer is that she actually learned how to swim. Because you know what? I mean, that's dangerous. You know, teach your kids. But um, when I think of salvation, the saving grace of God, the assurance that those of us who believe in Jesus, who trust in him, who have turned from sin, uh, the, the salvation that comes where we get to spend eternity with him, I'm sure that God feels the same way, right? Is he satisfied and fulfilled knowing that his action on the cross uh, fulfilled the need and now because of our trust in Jesus, we can spend eternity with him instead of eternity apart from him? Yes. In fact, I know that God is overjoyed when one person chooses it because Jesus actually said it in Luke. He said, in the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. God is overjoyed when one person chooses to follow Jesus. However, I think we've missed the mark a little bit with our definition of salvation. We know what salvation is, right? We teach it, and that's normally where the sermons end. But what is salvation for? So today, I want to talk about saving. And if you're like me, and you were not raised in church, that um, salvation, it seems like a really big word probably, but what it literally means is that we have been saved. It just simply means that you and I are trusting in Jesus by trusting in him. We have been saved from eternity apart from him. Because you and I, we were saved from something, but we were also saved for something. Right? We were saved from an eternity apart from Jesus, saved from a, a, a life that had no mission, that had no purpose, that was stale and meaningless. But we were also saved for something. The act of Jesus on the cross, yes, it saves us from hell and an eternity apart from him. It saves us from a life with no meaning pursuing our own desires. But it also saves you and I for something. So with all that said today, I'm going to ask and venture to answer these two questions. Number one, what is salvation? What is being saved? And number two, what is salvation actually 
for? What is that for? And just so you know, the uh, structure of this message is going to look a little bit like this. I'm going to, um, I, we just went over a story, you know, uh, talked a little bit about that girl. We're going to look and see what the Bible says about salvation. We're going to be specifically in Isaiah chapter 12 today. Um, I'm going to share a few points, and then I'm going to close with some practical application that First Church can use in the future. And as I seek to answer these questions, I just want you to realize that I'm not going to be able to answer everything that salvation is in one message. So I just think that is job security. And uh, it's a great reason to call me back in the future as a guest pastor to get to preach. Woo! Yeah, right? Yeah, some of y'all are excited about it. I am too. I'm so excited about getting to come and share what Jesus is doing in Iowa and celebrate what Jesus is doing here in Indiana. But the thing is, I don't even know if I could answer all that salvation is in a book. However, I'm going to give an overview. We're going to look to Scripture to see what the Word of God has to say about it. So if you have your Bibles today, we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 12. We're actually going to read the whole chapter today, so um, don't worry. It's only six verses, but you can brag to people. Be like, yeah, I read a whole chapter of the Bible today. Woo, that is awesome. So if you don't have your Bibles, that's okay. We'll always have the words on the screen for you. But if you have your Bibles, you can open them to Isaiah 12. There it says, in that day you will sing, I will praise you, O Lord. You were angry with me, but not anymore. Now you comfort me. See, God has come to save me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. The Lord God is my strength. He is my song. He has given me victory. With joy, you will drink deeply from the fountain of salvation. In that wonderful day, you're going to sing, thank the Lord, praise his name. Tell the nations what he has done. Let them know how mighty he is. Sing to the Lord, for he has done wonderful things. Make known his praise around the world. Last verse. Let all the people of Jerusalem shout his praise with joy, for great is the Holy One of Israel who lives among you. Will you pray with me? Father, God, we come before you and we thank you for your life. We thank you for your love and for your sacrifice on the cross. We thank you for um, everything that you mean to us and everything that you are doing here at First Church. And Jesus, we just pray that this would only be the beginning, that you would continue to move in our hearts and our minds. Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see your goodness, open our ears to hear your truth, and open our hearts to receive your message today so that each of us can grow one step closer to you. It's in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said... Okay, as we look to this verse, I hope you were looking into it because we actually see what salvation is and then what salvation is for. So what is salvation? Again, if you have been in church, you probably know the textbook definition that salvation is our preservation and deliverance from an eternity apart from God. But Isaiah, he goes a little bit deeper to show us the different facets of, uh, of salvation. You know, not only when I went to lifeguard training, lifeguard training wasn't just saving somebody, but it was doing CPR. It was learning how to do AED. It was learning how to enter the water and assess if there were head, neck, and back injuries. And just like that, salvation, it has one central definition, but there's so many different facets. So the first facet that I want to look at is in verse 1. Here it says, and this is really the standard definition of it, but you were angry with me, but not anymore. Now you comfort me. God, you once were angry with me. There was a division there, but not anymore. Now you comfort me. Salvation, partly, number one, is the turning of God's anger away from us. Salvation is the turning of God's anger away from us. This would be the key definition that a lot of people know it to be. When we read the account of Christ's passion on the cross, we see that the totality of our sin, the totality of God's wrath and anger was heaped onto Jesus. Essentially, what happened was God turned his back to Jesus so he could turn his face to you and me. God turned his back to Jesus so that he could turn his face to you and me. And we see this in the prayer that Jesus prays when he says, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? God turned his back to Jesus so he could turn his face to us. Salvation, it is the quenching of God's anger and the beginning of his endless grace and love and mercy to us for those of us who believe in Jesus, who have turned from sin to the Savior. It says, you were angry with me, but not any more. And now it says that God actually comforts us, which is this amazing thing. Jesus actually nicknamed the Holy Spirit and said, I'm leaving, but I'm going to send to you a comforter, someone that's going to comfort you. And uh, the, the thing is salvation, it doesn't come from our own deeds. It does not come from a search for ourselves, from living our best life, you know, from living out your truth. It doesn't come from doing you, boo-boo. Salvation, the quenching of God's anger, it, is, it does not come from anything this world has to offer. It comes through faith in Jesus, which leads to our next verse. As we look at verse two, it says, see, God has come to save me. I'm gonna trust in him. I'm not gonna be afraid. The Lord God is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust in him. I will not be 
afraid. As we look back at this verse, it says here that God has come to save me, but I really love how it bears it in another translation because it says, God is my salvation. Yes, God has saved me, but what is salvation? Salvation is a person. Salvation is God. It is Jesus. He is our salvation. He is our strength. He is the one in whom we trust. So point two, what is salvation? Salvation, it is only found in Jesus. And if you were like me before I came to know Jesus, that seems like a really bold statement, right? It flies in the face of liberalism. It flies in the face of progressive Christianity who say, you know what? Live your best life. Do you. You do you, boo-boo. Live your truth. Do what makes you happy. That was something that I heard so much in college in my years before knowing Jesus. If you have a teenager today, your kids are hearing that same message over and over and over again in mainstream media, on social media, on their TikTok. And for the longest time, I believed it to be true. I believed that the, one day the world could fulfill me, that one day it would fulfill that open uh, place in my heart, heal the trauma. But that verse, of verse two, it says no. It says live your life for God because he died for us. The only thing that has ever given me peace, that has truly given me joy, it's Jesus. And the knowledge of him and growing closer to him every day. It was the moment that I gave my life to Jesus that I realized his arm stretched out to me just like my arm was stretched out to that little drowning girl in the pool that day. And Jesus pulled me out. He breathed new life in through me, into me, and it is only through Jesus. And through the prophet Isaiah, God reminds us that salvation, it is found in him alone. Actually, in Acts 4, uh, hundreds of years later, uh, the uh, disciple Peter actually uh, reverberates these words, and he teaches when he is filled with the Holy Spirit in one of the best sermons ever, he says, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no, under, no other name under heaven by which you and I must be saved. So what is salvation? Is number one, the turning of God's anger from us. Number two, it is only through Jesus. And I'm getting to my third point. Before I get there, though, I just want to preface it. This isn't going to seem like the deepest, most profound point at first. I'm going to explain a little bit more, but some of y'all are going to be like, you went to seminary to learn that, right? You, you parsed out the Hebrew there, and that's what you came out with? Stick with me a little bit, okay? But what is salvation? Salvation, it is to be enjoyed. I know this doesn't seem like the deepest and most profound statement ever, but how many Christians do you know that are just trudging through life, angry, disgruntled, with a permafrown on their face, always angry and frustrated? The mark of a Christian, it is our love for one another. But Nehemiah, he talks and he says, hey, the joy of the Lord is our strength, God's joy. It is no wonder that people are not running to the church. Because when we look at this verse, we see that it says, with joy, you and I are going to drink deeply from the fountain of salvation with a permafrown? No. With anger and frustration? No. With anxiety riddledness? No. With joy, you and I, the church, we're going to come to the fountain and we're going to drink from the fountain of salvation. But how many Christians do you know that don't have that joy? It's no wonder that people aren't running to the church, that people aren't beating down our doors. Why? Because for so many of us, we are just posting on our Facebook what we are against rather than what we are for. We are constantly moping, sad, and angry. We are the people who say that we have an eternal hope in Jesus, that we have an eternity with God instead of separated from him. But so many times, the Christian just looks angry and sad instead of realizing that salvation, it is to be enjoyed. With joy, we are called to come to the fountain of salvation. You and I, we will drink with joy from that. When I jumped in and saved that little girl from drowning that day, she was scared as she realized what could have happened, how close she'd actually been to death. But she was so joyful that she was safe and alive. Today, I just wanna ask you, have you lost the joy of your salvation? Have you been there? Have you lost the excitement that came when you would open your Bible and hear uh, from God in the morning? Uh, have you lost the excitement that came when you would actually get in and praise and worship? Are you coming to church now out, more so out of an obligation or um, a habit rather than actually coming to communally come to the joy, the, with, with joy to the well of our salvation? I remember the moment I gave my life to Jesus. It, it sticks out in my mind, and I think about it pretty much every day. I was driving my 1991 Cadillac from church back to school, and I, I said to Jesus, I said, okay, if you are real, if, if, this is, if this is real, then I'm gonna give you my everything. I'm gonna pour everything that I am to you. I'm gonna turn from my sin, and I'm gonna ask you to be my savior and help me to follow you every day. Jesus, will you save me? 
In that moment, such joy filled me. Such wonder and awe overtook me as I realized that God had been angry, angry at me, but that his anger had been turned from me. That salvation, it was found only in God. And yes, that salvation, the salvation he had given me, it was to be enjoyed. And I cried, and I cry a good amount, in case you don't know me, right? Um, I've actually been crying a good amount the past two months. Don't worry, I still got three more Sundays here, and you'll see me crying a little bit more. Um, but I cried in that moment as this joy and fire overtook me. And I knew that uh, that salvation, I was saved from something, but also that God had saved me for something. I knew that God didn't just save me to sit back and to play it safe. I knew that Jesus didn't give his life for me and die on the cross so that I could squander it trying to be comfortable with my life. I knew deep down in my heart that there was something more for me, that God had saved me from something, but also that God had saved me for something. What is salvation? It is the delivering of God's people from an eternity apart from him, an eternity of pain and darkness. Salvation, it's us being saved from hell. Altogether, it is the turning of God's anger away from us. It is only found in Jesus. And salvation, yes, is to be enjoyed. And guess what? That's where most churches stop. And they're like, hey, that's salvation. If anybody wants it, raise your hand. We're going to pray for you. But as we look to the scripture, Isaiah is just getting started. He's like, no, those are just the first three verses. I've still got three more to tell you what salvation is for because Isaiah is just getting started. He tells us all about salvation, how wonderful it is. But then he goes on to tell us what salvation is for. So we're going to turn to verse 4, and there it says, In that wonderful day, you're going to sing, Thank the Lord, praise his name. Tell the nations what God has done. Let them know how mighty God is. Sing to the Lord, for he has done wonderful things. Make known his praise around the world. Let all the people of Jerusalem shout his praise with joy, for great is the Holy One of Israel who lives among you. I think that's where the church has gotten it wrong. In the past, it's become a consumer sport. It's become a place where we come and critique. Well, I mean, the sermon it went a little longer today. Or, you know what? They didn't play my favorite hymn. Or the donuts, you know, we used to have cronuts, but, you know, they aren't there anymore. When God never created the church to just be a service on Sunday. When God never created the church to just be a service on Sunday. The church, the original church, it was meant to be a community of people coming together from different backgrounds, coming together to share the story of what God has done in their lives, coming together to encourage one another, to help develop one another, coming together under the mission and the banner of Jesus Christ. And through Isaiah, God tells us what our salvation is for, that it's not just for us to enjoy. It's not just for us to sit on our hands. It's not just for us to be comfortable. The prophet here, he says, tell the nations what God has done. Tell Wheatfield what God has done. Tell DeMott what God has done. Tell Rensselaer what God has done. Tell Hebron and Crown Point and the, all of Northwest Indiana what God has done, who he is and uh, what he has done. Let them know how mighty God is. Make his praise known around the world. Are you hearing a similarity here? Because Jesus, in his last commission to the disciples, he said, go, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. What is salvation for? Salvation is to be shared. We all take part in receiving the salvation, but we are also called to take part in distributing that salvation as we tell others what God has done in our lives because salvation, it is not meant to just be uh, held onto. It is meant to be shared, to, given, uh, to be given out, to be shared with the nations. And you might be sitting in your th seat thinking, well, Zachary, I've done it. I've, I've been a Christian for a while. It's, I've just, it's too, I'm too old to share my faith. I've been a Christian. I used to serve in the nursery. I used to uh, serve as a youth sponsor at Nexion. I led Bible studies. I volunteered with the life groups. I was a sisterhood leader. Zachary already did that. I used to share my faith all the time. And if that's you, I just want to let you know I've read every book of the Bible. I've read into the nooks and the crannies. I've read the original languages. And never in any of my studies have I ever seen the word retire in any part of the Bible. You might be thinking that your time has passed but I want to let you know that Jesus is just beginning. If you are still alive, then God is not done with you. Nowhere in the Bible does it say get comfortable. Nowhere in the Bible does it say kick your feet up. It says share this salvation with the nations. So if, it's, if it's, this is the last message that I ever get to share with First Church, the last call to action that I ever get to give here, I want to ask you to share salvation. I want to ask you to be a part of God's work in this world. I want to ask you to get back to it. And I don't just want to say these things. I want to give you practical ways to do it. 
because you don't have to have gone to seminary, you don't have to have read every book in the Bible, you do not have to have been a Christian for a certain amount of time. All you have to have done is have come to the well of salvation and be ready to turn around and invite other people to it as well. How do you share salvation? The best way is just to share your story with someone. And I know that there is someone within your family who you have chips with, there is someone in your sphere of influence at work, somewhere that you have chips with who is near to you but far from God, who is just waiting for you to share what Jesus is doing in your life. And if you're like, no, Zachary, I don't have anyone, then I know that there is some cashier at Save A Lot or at Strax or wherever you go or at Family Express that you can say, hey, you know what? I mean, as we're waiting for my credit card to go through, can I just share with you a little bit about what Jesus has done? And I mean, they're obligated to like stand there and listen to you for a little bit. I mean, you got some sort of influence and their life may be falling apart. They may be needing to hear about what God has done in your life and what he can do in theirs. They may need an invitation, invitation to the fountain of salvation. And even if you said no to those two, then I know there is someone who you can reach with the message of Jesus because Isaiah makes it very clear here when he says, tell the nations what he has done. Tell the nations what God has done. Let them know how mighty he is. Sing to the Lord, for he has done wonderful things. Make known his praise around the world. Let all the people of Jerusalem, of Damata, of Wheatfield, of Northwest Indiana, shout his praise with joy. For great is the Holy One of Israel who lives among you. First Church, we are not just called to be a family that closes our doors, but we are called to swing them wide, to share the message of Jesus' grace with all the region, with all of Northwest Indiana, to share the good news about Jesus. We're called to invite them to the well so that they can drink deeply in with joy and come to know who Jesus is, what he did, and what he can do in their lives. And we're called to take part in what he is doing here and now. Now, to close, I just want you to come back with me to the lifeguard chair. Okay, uh, imagine uh, me up there. Imagine even you up there because I think something has happened within the church. One of, two, uh, one of a couple of things. A bunch of Christians, they've done a couple of things. They have gotten complacent in the chair. They've gotten comfortable with overlooking the pool of this world. I just want you to think about it. What if that day I was comfortable on the chair? What if that day I started thinking about, oh, well, you know what? I'm on this chair for me. Am I getting enough rays? Am I getting my vitamin D? Come on, is the sun feeding me? Am I getting fed by this? Because that's what I need. Is this chair comfortable enough? You know what? I don't know, that, that chair over there at that pool, it, ha it, has, nice, it has nicer comfort uh, padded chairs. Wow, do I like the finish on the carpet in this chair? Am I getting enough sun and attention? Do I like the color of it? You know what? I think that pool over there, they have nicer swimsuits. I'm gonna go over there and I'm gonna sit in their chair. I think I'm gonna go to another pool because that lifeguarding chair, I mean, the, the carpet is greener on the other side. What if I'd gotten distracted that day? Just like the church has, we've gotten distracted with these things. Our eyes, they get focused on us and me and my, instead of the mission of God. We become so inwardly focused on me and my, maintaining the status quo, thinking about our needs, our desires, our wants, instead of the people in the pool. And while we are doing that, while we are focusing on the wrong things, that little girl is down there in the pool and she's drowning and she is dying. And we're just sitting up there in our chair, concerned about with our shorts and the carpet, getting fed by the sun. And the life is leaving her body as she loses her last breath. And that's the church. That's what we are doing. And while we are doing that, there are people in the pool of this world that are drowning. And some of us, we've gotten so callous in this faith that was never meant to be about us, but that was meant to be all about God's grace and mission flowing through us as we tell the nations about what God has done in our lives. And we sit there on that chair and we just watch them die. Can you imagine if this story had been different if I just sat up there, if I just sat up there and let that girl drown, if I had stayed there more focused on me and my own needs as her last breath left her body. You know what, there's some of us as Christians and that's literally what we do. Oh, you know what? That crazy person, they are too messed up. Oh, you know what? They're too conservative or they are just too liberal or they're just too whatever it is. You know what, Zachary? I'm just gonna love them from a distance. I'm, I still love them, but I'm just gonna love them from the distance. And we forget that Jesus never loved us from a distance, but he was always closer to us than our very own breath, always near to us and ready and willing to open his arms with grace and forgiveness the moment that we turn from sin. 
Church, where's the urgency? We just sit in our chairs and we watch them struggle and we just wonder, is the roast burning? I mean, this pastor is going on too long. We focus on our needs or whether or not we are getting fed instead of realizing that there are people in Wheatfield, in DeMott, in Hebron, in Crown Point, and in Rensselaer who, if they died, would not spend eternity with God, but would spend eternity separated from Him. We forget that there are people who are near to us, but far from God. We forget that our mission is not to make fancy churches or to even get the church to do what we want, but it is to be the church. We're not just meant to, we're just, we're not called to come to church. We are called to be the church. Are we more concerned with our own comfort? Are we more concerned with keeping things the way that they are? Or are we living each day on purpose, seeking after God and his truth and helping others too as well? To close, I just wanna ask you three questions and I would love if you took the moment to just ask these questions to yourself as you are driving, ask your, you know, the person in your car, the person on your couch this week at dinner time or your life group, will you just take a moment to ask these questions, go around the table. But question number one is, if all of your prayers, if all the prayers you prayed this week were answered, who would be saved? If God answered every prayer that you prayed this week, every moment that you reached out to him, who would actually come to know Jesus Christ? Church, we gotta get back to our mission. We gotta focus on what Jesus called us to, to invite others to the well of salvation and to realize that salvation, it is to be shared. Question number two, who's near to you but far from God? I know that there is someone in your life who is just waiting for you to share the message of Jesus, for you to just say, hey, you know what? Easter is coming up. And if you want to learn how to share your faith, there is a great class on April 4th that I would love for you to be a part of. I would love for us to have to have overflow because the whole church is like, I wanna be a part of sharing salvation. How can I do it? But number two, who is near to you but far from God? And then number three, are you ready to be a lifeguard? As I went and interviewed at my church in Davenport, Iowa, the question that came up so much was, why are you so passionate about this? You know, <laughs> why are you so passionate about sharing the message of Jesus? It's because for years before I chose to follow Jesus, I was just like that little girl. I was in the pool and I was drowning and I was flailing and I was crying out for help. I literally went up to Christian lifeguards. I, I screamed up to their chair and I was like, I need to be saved. How do I do this? You tell me about a God who can do miracles. How can I have that same God work a miracle in my life? But churches were too focused on the padding in the pews, the color of the carpet, making sure their favorite hymn was played, a myriad of, of other things to the point that they didn't see the drowning boy in front of them with drug addicted parents with deep trauma, with no functional family begging for help, drowning in sin, about to lose his last breath and go under for good. Thank God that I finally found a place where they invited me to the well of salvation, where they shared that salvation with me. My friend, Christy, she simply shared what Jesus was doing in her life. She said, hey, this is how God is changing my life. You wanna come to church with me? I said, yeah, it was a little weird. I'd never really been to church before. They lifted their hands in worship. They sang about their feelings, you know? I, I, I never really cried before I was a Christian because I just shoved all my feelings down. So, but I came to know Jesus there. I came to give my life to Christ and it's 12 years later now that I stand before you preparing to go and be a senior pastor at a church and share what Jesus is doing here with them, share what God has done in my life with them and ask them to be a part of the work of Jesus. And I say this because this might be the last commission that I ever get to give to First Church. My hope and my prayer and my desire is that this would be a place that is relentlessly steadfastly, immovably and unshakably focused on the mission of Jesus Christ, on living out great, uh, God's great commission work, seeing people far from God be filled with new life because that is discipleship. This outline here, that is what a rich and deep discipleship oriented church looks like. And that means that we are people who seek people who are far from God. And I want and desire and plead that you would continue to be the church and not just come to church? Will you be part of seeing this region and this area come to know Jesus? Will you be part of reaching the lost? Will you be part of living out the great commission? I don't desire to be the only lifeguard here. And I know that Pastor John doesn't desire to as well. What we desire to be, what we want to be, our whole purpose in life is to be lifeguard trainers. 
We want to help you be part of God's mission. We want to help you live on purpose and see people filled with new life in Jesus. Is it going to be easy? No. Are we probably always going to agree on everything? Probably not. But will we be seeking to grow closer to Jesus? Will we learn together more and more what it means to be the church of Jesus in a broken world? Will we together see his kingdom come and his will be done in Northwest Indiana? As it is in heaven? Yes. So first church, I want to ask you to be the church to not just receive that salvation, but to share it with the world who so desperately needs the message of Jesus Christ, the message of his love in this broken world, the message of his grace, of his forgiveness. Salvation, it is the deliverance of us from hell, but it is also the good news that is to be shared with the world. And that seems like a tall order, right? The whole world? But how do you eat like a big hamburger, one bite at a time? And how do you share the message of Jesus with the whole world, one person at a time? Hey, can, can I just tell you what Jesus is doing in my life? Hey, you know, the youth pastor, he, he was leaving and he, and he told me I better share it. So will you just sit down for, with for like five seconds for me while I, I just share what Jesus is doing in my life? Because I want to be a part of reaching people for Christ. Will you be part of reaching this region for Jesus Christ? Will you be part of, seeing, of making a lasting legacy for Christ in his church in this area? Will you not just come to the well, but turn to others and say, hey, here's the well of salvation. Will you come with me? Come with me to Easter. Come with me to service. I'll sit by you. Will you be a part of God's lasting work here in the area? Will you pray with me? Jesus, we come before you. We thank you for your grace, for your love. We thank you for your forgiveness and the message of redemption and salvation that is only found in Jesus. And Jesus, I just pray that in this next season, that this, uh, as my book closes, that the door would still be open for First Church to reach this region, to reach this area, to reach the lost with the message of your grace, of your forgiveness, of your truth, and that Jesus, we would truly see your redemptive work be filled out, be fulfilled here. In DeMott and Weefield and Hebron and Roselawn and Rensselaer and Crown Point all around. And Jesus, we just ask that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done in our lives and in this region. I thank you for this church and for what you're doing here. And we just pray that this would just be the beginning. It's in the mighty, the matchless, the most amazing name of Jesus Christ that we pray. And everyone said, amen. Thanks so much, First Church. Will you stand with us as our band leads us in one more song of worship?